special welcome again to, uh, I see some new faces out here as well, so thank you for being here. For uh, I see some old faces as well that uh, used to worship with us and back in town, so thank you for being here. And uh, for all of you, just a pleasure to, to be in the Lord's house and uh, to hear his word again this morning. You know, as a kid, and even to this day, one of my favorite things to do is to look at family scrapbooks. Anybody with me? You ever have a scrapbook that you just go back and you look at pictures at? Yeah, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, the, all the pictures that you've assembled through the years of various events. And one thing that you'll find in most of these scrapbooks are those famous first day of school pictures, right? What you were wearing back in third grade. How you were smaller than the backpack that you were even carrying. You see, I think scrapbooks have kind of been replaced with social media these days. Memories that pop up on your social media wall. But really what, what social media is, it's just another scrapbook of your life. What was I thinking on this day? What picture comes to mind when uh, you go on vacation It pops up on your wall? Where are you transported to? What do you think of when you see these pictures and these scrapbooks of your lives? It's fun to compare year after year those famous first day of school pictures. But those pictures, they bring a specific point to mind, most likely, when you look at them. They remind you what happened in that school year. Was that the year you lost your two front teeth, right? Was that the year you had him or her as your teacher? Was that the year you had all the homework? Was that the year you got your braces on or your braces off? Was that the year you won district with your team? Those first day pictures, they not only recall that day, but they also recall the days that followed in the year that followed. So this morning, we get kind of a first day picture in the life of Jesus. No, it's not the first day of school of Jesus. Jesus is near 30 years old at this point. The, the picture that we get is a wedding picture. And now let's be clear about something so we don't start any heretical rumors. This is not Jesus' wedding picture, okay? Rather, it's a picture of a wedding that Jesus attended where he performed something pretty remarkable his first miracle, his first public miracle. This picture of Jesus' first miracle, it not only reminds us of what Jesus did that day, but all the miracles that followed, because he is who he says he was. He's God. The Old Testament, it's, it's full of weddings and banquet imagery to symbolize the coming of the Messianic age. That is the time when Jesus comes back and he's reigning over all things with us. Isaiah 62.5, it says it this way. It's a perfect example of this union that's going to happen. It says, as a young man marries a young woman, so your builder will marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so your God will rejoice over you. Beautiful imagery again. Jesus, he uses the wedding and the banquet imagery throughout his teaching. In Matthew 22, he says, He's speaking to them again in a parable, and he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Revelation uses it to describe heaven itself. In Revelation 19, it says, Then the angel said to me, Right blessed are those who, invite, who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so now we, we're here in John chapter 2, and Jesus, he's attending this wedding. And John tells us what should already be obvious. And this is the, really the main point of this entire text. We're going to get into a lot of other sub-points of, of this text. But the main point of this text, he tells us in verse 11. He says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of signs which through he revealed his glory to us. And his disciples believed in him. The whole point of this miracle of turning water into wine was to reveal who he was. But did you notice how he doesn't start his ministry at a funeral? He doesn't start it healing a blind man, raising someone from the dead. That would have got a lot of attention. He sets the tone for his ministry at a wedding. In John 2, verse 1, it says, On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. See, the wedding was a perfect place for Jesus to perform the first of many miracles, revealing to his disciples then and now that he is God. In this wedding that Jesus' disciple, John, he writes for us today as a firsthand account, a witness to this, this wedding that they're invited to in Cana, it's not far from the place that Jesus 
where he grew up, in his hometown of Nazareth. We're told that Jesus' mother, Mary, even knew that they were running out of wine here. But let's backtrack just a little bit. You see, this happens after Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. After his baptisms, he's baptized. He spent time in the desert, in the wilderness, being tempted by the devil. And now Jesus, he's traveling to this area of Galilee on the northern part of Israel where he begins to assemble a small group of men, a small group of disciples, as we heard Pastor Hirsch preach on just a couple of weeks ago. And I got to say this about John's gospel. If you're looking at the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they mention uh, the time where Jesus goes into the wilderness, where he's tempted, right? John, he doesn't mention that. He wrote his gospel way after those gospels had been written, and so he allows for gaps of time to happen. And so when you read this, that's why he doesn't mention this. He's kind of filling in where maybe some of the other gospels didn't hit on, and he has a unique perspective here. As we know, he's the one that wrote this story. And as I said, we know that Jesus' mother Mary, she knew that the wine was running out, so maybe she was a friend of the bride or the groom helping them serve this feast, it wouldn't be likely that a guest of the wedding would, uh, would know that this was happening. But, of course, the bride and the groom, they're there as well. And in Jesus' day, the groom and his groomsmen, they would start at his house by getting all kinds of supplies ready uh, for this big celebration, this party. And then they would travel to the bride's house where they would meet her and her bridesmaids and lead them through a procession through town. It ended back at his house where uh, the big celebration was to go on for a week. And this groom, he didn't stockpile enough wine for his party, but he did invite Jesus, and Jesus did not come alone. Three days earlier, he had called some fishermen uh, to follow him, Andrew, Peter, James, John, Philip, Nathaniel. They'd all just recently become Jesus' full-time students. And when Jesus, he called them, he promised that they would see some pretty amazing things, and he wasn't kidding, and we're going to see that in the story today. At this wedding, they would learn just how delightful it is to be in the presence of Jesus. You see, Mary, she is the first one to realize that there is a problem going on. It says in verse 3, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. I think there's just a, a quick point to make with this. When Mary sees a problem, she takes it to Jesus. Can you imagine hosting a party, promising everyone dinner, drinks, and then 10 minutes into your dinner, you have to get up to the mic, excuse me, we're all out, right? We're all out of food, we're all out of wine. It makes my palms sweat just saying that and thinking about that, right? It's like, how many of you have heard of Fire Festival? The party that never really got started, right? Everybody flying to this island, promised a good time, promised all the drinks, all the food, all the entertainment, and they get there and what happens? Nothing's really ready, <laughs> The party is over before it even starts. Kind of the same thing here. You see, the importance of hospitality in Jesus' day, in the ancient world, in general, it it cannot be overstated. To be invited to an event, particularly by someone who uh, may be above you socially, and to refuse that invitation, it would have been unthinkably bad. And that's kind of a situation that Jesus, he, he uses very often in the parables The only thing worse than that is to host a party and fail to be hospitable to your guests. To do that would get you canceled by the cancel culture in the most cancelable way it's possible, to be canceled so that you can never be uncanceled again. That's what's going on. So by some miscalculation, that's what's happening here. Somehow the unthinkable has happened. Maybe somehow the guest list got out of control. Has that ever happened to you when you're planning a party or a wedding? Just kind of snowballs, right? Maybe friends started inviting friends and they showed up or something like that. Maybe the harvest was bad. We don't know. And the year and the supply of wine was so low that it was more expensive than they thought. Or maybe the guests just drank more than they were supposed to. However it happened, very early on into this typical seven-day wedding feast, they ran out of wine. And man, they would never live it down if this happened. The embarrassment, the shame among friends and family forever. So, Mary goes to Jesus. She knows who he is. She remembered when that angel came to her and announced that her child would be born, he would be the son of God. If anybody can help in this situation, Jesus can. But she also knows Jesus' heart. Saving a, a celebration like this was not beneath him. 
in any way. Mary, she sees a problem, and she went to the one who was willing and able to help. And I think we can learn from Mary. Maybe you're facing a problem as well. Maybe it's not a life and death problem. Maybe it's small compared to what other people are dealing with in life. But be reminded and know who Jesus is and his heart for you and his love for you, his grace for you. Nothing is too hard for him and nothing is too small for him. If you have a need, take it to the Lord. When you see a problem, do as Mary does. Take it to Jesus. At first, it may seem like something was just a little bit off with the way that Mary was thinking. As we read on in verse 3 and 4, she said to him, they have no more wine. And then Jesus says this, woman, why do you involve me? And he says, my hour has not yet come. Man, (laughs) if I said woman, (laughs) why do you involve me? To my mother? (laughs) She slapped me upside the head. Or something worse that I don't even want to think about. See, naturally, in our culture these days, Jesus' response to Mary, it sounds really harsh to our ears, doesn't it? But Jesus, he's not really being rude to his mom here. The word woman is the same word he uses when he's hanging on the cross. And he assigns the apostle John to take care of his mother Mary. In John 19, it says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, Standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. This whole exchange here, it shows just a deep level of concern that Jesus has for his well-being of his mom, that she would be taken care of after he died. Jesus is entrusting Mary into his disciples' care. Many who believe is John, who is the author of the story today. So when we hear this word woman used in this context, instead of woman, a modern equivalent might be ma'am or my dear, something that's very endearing. So while Jesus' answer, it sounds harsher in English than it did in his language, this term is showing love. And we hear Jesus, he responds with him saying, his hour has not yet come. And that should make you immediately pause. What is he talking about? My hour has not yet come. What's that make you think of? Immediately, his hour has not yet come. The hour of Jesus' death, when God would lift him up and glorify his son, when he would die for the forgiveness of everyone. You know, one very well-known Bible commentator by the name of Richard Linsky, he puts it a way that I found very helpful. And I just want to quote for you what he wrote about this this section, about Jesus' hour not yet coming. He says, Jesus' hour is the one appointed for him by the Father. It may be the hour for this or for that in his redeeming work. When it comes, he acts, and not until it comes. So Jesus, he never hurries. He never lets others hurry him. He waits for his hour, and then he meets it. He is never uneasy or full of fear, for nothing can harm him until his hour comes. And when it comes, he gives his life into death. Here, the hour is the one arranged for the first miraculous manifestation of his glory. In performing this miracle, he will not be rushed or harassed into anything, even by his mother. In the words not yet come, it lies the promise that his hour will indeed come. And this is what leads Mary to say what she does next to those who are helping serve at this wedding. She says, do whatever he tells you. You see, Mary, she trusts him and that he will act on his time out of his great love and compassion when the time is right. But let's not lose sight of what Mary does when she sees the problem. When she sees something that might need a little bit more extraordinary help, she takes it to Jesus. She trusts him. Have you ever been there before? Where your problems, the little ones, the big ones, the ones in between, they start to weigh on you. The burdens are getting a little bit too heavy to carry much longer. Jesus, would you take this for me? Would you do it like now, please, right? Jesus, I know you care about my sickness, and I know you're able to help, so will you heal me now? Jesus, I've been living paycheck to paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. It's getting old. Would you act? Would you help me? Jesus, this relationship's not what I thought it would be. Jesus, can you help me? Would you step in? It's getting harder every day to live for you. You see, often Jesus, he's working on a different timeline 
than yours. But he wants us to remember that his love, that his grace, it never wavers in anything, especially in us. It never wavers that his plans and his timing, it's perfect. And he will act when it's time to act. And until that time, we trust in him. So when Jesus' time was different from Mary's, what does she do? She says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. She doesn't argue. I wonder how many times Mary had experienced this before. Enough times to trust his timing was better than hers. That he'll act when he's ready. Until then, do whatever he says. So what do you do when Jesus isn't helping you as quickly as you hoped he would? I suggest you do what Mary does. You do whatever Jesus says. You cling to his word. You spend time with him. You let him reveal to you through prayer, through spending time in his word, what he would have for you. And in the end, you know how it worked out for Mary. And God, he promised that it will work out for you as well. I wonder what she talked about on the way home from this wedding. Mary, what she thought about. Maybe it was the compassion and the love that Jesus showed. I wonder if she kept a mental picture, that first day picture, in her head for the months and years to follow. My guess is that she did. She liked to ponder on these things and keep them close to her heart, as we read many times. But I'll bet some of those thoughts on her way home that night was just one word. Wow. With a big smile on her face. Let's read on. John chapter 2, starting at verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. You see, this is one of those verses that you want to kind of just throw away. It's like, okay, it's just filler information. But there's actually a little bit more here to it, another sub-point, if you will, of the text, something that we can actually draw from this, and we shouldn't just skip over it. What's he mean by ceremonial washing, right? When arriving at this wedding, it would have been customary to provide the guests with ceremonial water to wash the face and the feet before each meal, And more water to wash the hands. And this wasn't just for cleanliness. You know, there's a myth that people in Jesus' day, they were just always filthy. And they stayed like that. People in those times, they like to be as clean as possible, especially with a celebration like this that's going on, just like we do today. So they wiped their feet. They washed their hands when they could. And these water in these stone jars was for additional ceremonial washing, as it says. The Old Testament purification laws by the first century uh, Judaism had been expanded upon so that it was a common practice of most to perform additional washing to be sure that they were ritually and spiritually clean, as well as physically before eating. It is the ceremonial water that Jesus chooses to turn water into wine. And wine is one of those metaphors that Jesus uses to announce the the coming of the kingdom of God. And the ceremonial water in these stone jars, in a way, in a way, represents the old law, the old covenant, the old order of things. And the old has been completely changed, hasn't it? It's been fulfilled. It's been completely turned into something new and different. The old merely pointed to spiritual cleansing. It merely symbolized righteousness. It couldn't really make anyone spiritually clean. The blood of animals could not really wash away sins once and for all. The ceremonial water couldn't really make you righteous, perfect, before a holy God. But now the kingdom of God has arrived in Jesus, and like new wine, it completely changes everything. It fulfills and it replaces the old. The blood of Christ is offered once and for all, poured out on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and he makes a new covenant with us, a one that lasts forever. Verse 7 says, Jesus said to the servants, fill these jars with water. And so they filled them all the way up to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best. Till now. I guess you can say when Jesus makes wine, he really makes wine, right? Six stone jars of wine would be about 900 bottles of wine for this. And the master of the banquet, he would be the one who was the most trained, the most knowledgeable about the wine, the one that had the most refined palate in the room. 
And he says that this wine is what? The best wine. Because of Jesus, this party, this celebration could go on for a few more days like a good wedding in those days should. And Jesus, he does this all in secret. Who did the master of the banquet approach? It was the bridegroom. He gets the credit for this miracle. This guy's wedding went down in Cana history, not as the most disastrous, but as the most delightful. Instead of his wedding being an embarrassment that he never lived down, instead of it going down in Cana history as the most disastrous wedding ever, it'll be remembered as one of the best, if not the best, that ever happened. I guess you could say that the bridegroom's worst decision may have been not getting enough wine, but his best decision was inviting Jesus to that celebration. And I don't know what the groom thought as he fell asleep that night, but I bet it included the word, wow, and a smile on his face. But isn't that just like Jesus? He does something amazing, and then he lets all the benefit go to someone else who doesn't deserve it. But what else would you expect from the man who came to serve and not be served, but give his life for a ransom for many? That Jesus lived a perfect life, that he, that he died on that cross, an innocent death. He rose victoriously from that grave. And when the Lord of life, he comes looking for someone to congratulate about all these things, who does he approach? It's you. He gives it all to you. He takes care of you. It's pretty amazing. We can learn from the disciples in this story as well. Three days earlier, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, and Andrew, or Nathaniel, had been just living their life. They would wake up, fish, eat, sleep, repeat. It seemed like that was their day every day. And then Jesus shows up and he says, follow me. And they do. He promised that they would see amazing things, and they did. Do you think they ever wondered what their new life would be like? What will life with Jesus be? be like. They were still figuring it out when Jesus, he takes them to this wedding, the best wedding of all time with the tastiest of wine that was overflowing. This is what life with Jesus can be like. It's joy. It's laughter. It's family reunion. It's fun. It's delightful. It's the abundance of God's care and his grace. Second Corinthians 9, Paul, he reminds us that God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And I love the imagery there of thinking back to those stone jars. And they weren't just filled halfway. They weren't filled three-quarters of the way. All the way up to the brim, it says, where they're overflowing. And what a beautiful picture of God's grace in our lives that you can never outsend God's grace. It doesn't mean we take it for granted. But there's something beautiful to that. That God, he pours out himself abundantly over and over and over again. And he gives to you over and over and over again. He wants to. You receive that forgiveness when you ask for it. You see, it's no coincidence that Jesus, he begins his ministry, his public ministry, after being baptized with a miracle at the wedding feast. He's making a promise to his disciples. And they got the message. Again, it says what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. And yes, they may have doubted that life with Jesus is always delightful when they saw him suffer or when they would go on and suffer along with him as well. But those are the realities of what it's like sometimes to walk with Jesus on this earth. But in the end, Jesus will keep his promise. He is faithful. Listen to what he says and what he promises for all his faithful people. Prophet Isaiah in, ver in uh, chapter 25, verse 6 says, The Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best meats and the finest of wines. That's what life with Jesus is like. And here on earth, we get little foretastes of this life. When you laugh so hard, you start to cry. It's a foretaste of the heavenly joy that's awaiting us. When you eat something that makes you close your eyes so that you can just taste it a little bit better, it's a foretaste. When you need a friend and God provides one, that is a foretaste. When you take and eat the bread and drink the wine and Holy Communion like we just have, you receive his very body and blood and the assurance of the forgiveness of your sins, that is a foretaste of the heavenly communion that we will have with our Savior and with all who have died in the faith believing in Jesus. There are plenty 
difficulties on this earth. But don't let that distract you from where you're headed. That is to a wedding, a banquet, a banquet that will put even this wedding to Cana, in Cana to shame. So that when you do experience something del delightful, just like Jesus' disciples, you can put your trust in him. At times, the Christian life can feel a little dreary, but I hope this story for us today, it uncovers the beautiful truth about life with Jesus. It's delightful, it's abundant, and it will be for eternity because Jesus is who he says he is. He's God. We picture Jesus, you know, we just sing that song, even so come, like a bride waiting for her groom. We think of Jesus as the bridegroom. And what that means for us, if he's the bridegroom, who are we? We're the bride. Guys, how are you doing with that? Being a bride. You know, it's a little hard sometimes to think about, just being honest, we don't take a lot of time to think about that. But it's a beautiful picture that we need to think about. Jesus being our bridegroom and us being the bride, how, what that means for us, that Jesus protects us, that he loves us, that he cherishes us, that he forgives us, that he gives everything of himself to us. I have no problem being a bride of Jesus if that's what that means. I pray you do as well. You know, we stand before a holy God one day. We stand next to the bridegroom, to Jesus, and we're seen covered in his righteousness of Christ himself, standing in the abundance of God's grace and forgiveness, and we'll be welcomed into his kingdom. And I bet you one of the first words that we're going to say is, wow, with a big smile on our face. And what a picture-perfect day that'll be. In Jesus' name, amen.